Hello and welcome back. Now, last time I looked at decoupling capacitors, we've seen that the larger and the better quality the capacitor is, the better it will work in your circuit. Now, better is not always possible. I mean, this is a very nice, very big capacitor, but if you're building something like this, it's not going to really fit inside. So even though you would want a really big capacitor, depending on what you're trying to build, it might not be the right approach. So what I want to do today is look at what is the minimum capacitance value that you can use in your circuit and still get the desired effect. What I want to look at in particular is how to choose the right capacitor to get the minimum voltage drop during a low transient and of course how to keep the system stable. So if you're curious, then keep watching. Now, when choosing the capacitor, there's two main aspects that you need to take into account. Keeping the system stable, because the wrong capacitor value might lead to an unwanted oscillation, and keeping the voltage drop on the capacitor as small as possible, within acceptable lines of course, during a low transient. So let's look at both of these things one by one. So the first thing we need to take into account is the equivalent series resistance of the capacitor. The voltage drop on the capacitor during a low transient will be equal to the current of the transient times this ESR. So if we quickly simulate the circuit, we can see that if we add one amp low transient, the voltage on the output will drop to 9.9 .9 volts. So the drop will be of 100 millivolts, which is exactly the 100 milliohms times the one amp. If on the other hand, our capacitor is much, much worse. So the ESR is 500 milliohms, then the voltage drop will be five times worse than this. So one of the things to take into account is that we need a capacitor with a low series resistance. Now, if we look at an ideal situation, so when we have no series resistance, not on the capacitor, not on the inductor side, we will still have a voltage drop. So the voltage drop will be appearing because it takes the inductor some time to react to the current pulse. And in this time, the capacitor is discharging. So when these two meet, we will have a minimum voltage. And we can work this out using this formula. So our transient impedance will be our voltage variation divided by the current variation. So let's say if we want a voltage variation of 100 millivolts only, when the current varies by one amp, so with our one amp pulse, our transient impedance is 0.1, so if we have a series inductance of 1 microhenry divided by 0.1 squared, it gives us 100 microfarads. So if we run this simulation and we look at the output, we can see that the voltage did drop by 100 millivolts, as we did expect from the formula. But we also notice one more thing. It doesn't just drop, it starts to oscillate. So basically what we achieved by applying a load pulse to this sort of series LC circuit is an oscillator. And this of course is something we definitely don't want. We want a minimum voltage drop, but we don't want the system to end up oscillating. And the way to fix this is to add a bit of resistance. So to get this oscillation as damped as possible. And we can calculate the exact resistance value by calculating the damping factor of the circuit. So what we will end up building is a series RLC circuit. And to get it to not oscillate, we want a damping factor of at least one. So you can read about it more here on the Wikipedia page. But if we go to a simulation, I got here three different circuits. I added the 100 milliohm resistance to my circuit. So this is the circuit we started off with. And if we look at it, we see that it has a bit of an oscillation. And this is basically caused by the fact that the damping factor is 0.5. So the system is under damped. Now we can give the system a damping factor of one if we increase the capacity. So if we go to 400 microfarads 
And in this case, we can see that we're still dropping by 100 millivolts because of the ESR, so that didn't change. But the voltage is no longer overshooting, so it's a bit better. And if we want to completely eliminate this overshoot, we go to an overdamped circuit. So where the damping factor is above 1. In this case, I increase the capacitance to 1600 microfarads. So the damping factor is 2 this time. And if we look at this system, we can see that there's absolutely no overshoot anymore. So you can see that the voltage slowly rises back to normal and everything's fine. Now in real life, of course, you don't just have the ESR in the capacitor, you also have some sort of resistance on the wiring. So this resistance that is plugged into the damping factor calculation is split up between the wire, so with the inductor, and the capacitor. Now one extreme case is this one in which all the resistance is in the capacitance. We have another extreme case in which the resistance is split halfway between the inductor and the capacitor. And this gives quite an interesting result. So we can see that we have a voltage drop of 50 millivolts because of the series resistance. So no matter what we do, we will still have this voltage drop. But we can see that the voltage on the load side transitions very abruptly from one to the other. So this almost looks like a perfect square wave. And the problem with this sort of system is that this sort of transition can be highly emissive. So there's a lot of energy in this very straight transition. Ideally, what you will want is to have more resistance in the wire than in the capacitor. So if we look at the extreme case in which all the resistance is in the wire and nothing is in the capacitor, then we have this nice smooth transition. So basically this is what we would want. We don't want any oscillations, we don't want any extra voltage drop caused by the ESR, we want the voltage to transition from one threshold to the other as smoothly as possible. And basically we need to choose a capacitor and a capacitance value that can ensure this. Now this all looks very nice. Let's see how this actually translates into a real life circuit. So what I want to do is decouple the circuit that I've been working on last time. So take the basic switch and 10 ohm load, I will be supplying it from an 8.5 volt battery and just to simulate longer wires or a dedicated filter, I will be putting in an 8.2 microhenry inductor. Now to start off, to get a sense of what sort of capacitance value we will need, we can use this basic idealized formula to calculate the capacitance value. So what we will need will be the voltage drop that is acceptable for the circuit the current variation, which for an 8.5 volt battery with a 10 ohm load should be around 850 milliamps in ideal conditions. And by knowing the inductance, we can calculate what sort of capacitance value we should be using. So I went ahead and computed the capacitance values for three different cases. So when our voltage drop is 100, 200 or 300 millivolts. And now of course, this is the ideal case in which no wire resistance or ESR is taken into account. So to keep things in the 2 to 300 millivolt range of voltage drop, we can start off with a capacitor of around 100 microfarads and then see where that takes us. So depending on the wire resistance, the ESR, after we start off with the circuit, we can start to see where to go if we need more or less. So let's build the circuit and see just how it works. And this is the setup that I came up with. So on the right side we can see the actual implementation and on the left side a simulation model for it. So I got my switching transistor and the 10 ohm load. I'm driving this from the signal generator. I got my decoupling capacitors, 100 nanofarad ceramic and 100 microfarad aluminum electrolytic one. And I'm supplying this from an 8.5 volt battery and through an 8.2 microhenry inductor. And now in the simulation I put 8.5 just to compensate for any extra inductance caused by the wiring and so on. And to measure the circuit, I have my oscilloscope probe and to get a better resolution, I set the oscilloscope into DC mode, so not to have any offset, but I'm AC coupling it through these capacitors here. So I'm coupling it through a 100 microfarad capacitor. And if I run this thing, I get something like this. Now, it's not a very pretty waveform, but there's quite a lot we can learn from it to better model the circuit and to figure out 
how we can fix it. So what we can see first of all is the voltage drop between the two stable regions. So when there is no load and when the load is connected. And that is 216 millivolts. And this voltage drop is mainly caused by the wire resistance, the inductor's resistance and the battery's internal resistance. So we can model all of this as the wiring resistance. And to figure out exactly the value, we can work out the current. And to work out the current, we know that the voltage drop on the resistor is the 8.5 volts of the power supply minus this 200 millivolts from the resistance of the wiring and approximately 0.8 volts on the transistor. So it's not perfectly saturated. And we can work out that the current is 748 milliamps. Now we can take this current and use it to calculate the exact value of the resistance. So the resistance of the wire will be the voltage drop on the wiring, so the 200 millivolts, divided by the 750 milliamps of current going through it. So we can work out that the wire has a resistance of 290 milliohms. Now another thing that we can work out from the measurement is the ESR of the capacitor. So right when the load turns on, all of the energy is being supplied from the local decoupling capacitors and since there's a certain amount of serious resistance in the capacitor, we get this very straight voltage drop. So even if we zoom into it, we see that it's dead straight. So it's not a slow decrease in voltage, but rather a straight drop. And based on this voltage drop value, we can work out the ESR now. So again, first of all, we need to see the current going through our resistor, which will be the voltage that the capacitor was charged up to, so the 8.5, and from which we need to now subtract the voltage drop on the transistor and the voltage drop on the ESR, so this massive drop here, so the 360 millivolts. And again, we know that the resistor has 10 ohms, so we can work out that the current is 734 milliamps. And now we can take this current and the voltage drop and work out that the ESR is 490 milliohms. So if we simulate, just to check that we've done some good mathematics here, so we can see that the simulated waveform is almost identical to the one in the measurement. So we have a voltage drop when the voltage stabilizes of 219 volts. So basically exactly the same value that we measured. And also the voltage drop when first the ESR kicks in is 300 and around 62, 63. So we're dead on with the measurement. Now, the measurement doesn't look good. So how can we fix it? Well, we know that the main problem is this ESR drop. So the next thing we can try to do is reduce the ESR. And one common way of doing that is to put multiple capacitors in parallel. So if you have two similar capacitors in parallel, the ESR will be in parallel, so it will be halved. So my next experiment was to put two of these aluminum electrolytics. And now if we go to the simulation, what we should be expecting from this is quite a big reduction in the voltage drop and much nicer stabilization. And if we go to the actual measurements, we see a really similar picture. So here in the measurement, we have an initial voltage drop that is a bit lower than our stabilization threshold. So it's not exactly like in the simulation, but this can be caused by tolerances in the series resistance of the capacitors. But we still get this hump thingy. So it's still not a very clean transition. But this can be one of the ways to reduce the voltage drop when choosing decoupling capacitors. So you need to ensure the minimum capacity, but you also need to ensure that the ESR is small enough. Now another thing you could try is use better capacitors. And by better I mean have lower ESR. Next I tried to replace the aluminum electrolytic with a tantalum capacitor. Again 100 microfarads, so both capacitors had the same capacity, but the tantalum capacitor usually has much much lower series resistance and inductance. And by measuring this circuit, we have a completely different waveform. So what we can see in this one is that we have the same stabilization threshold. So again, we have the 200 millivolts of voltage drop caused by our wire resistance. That didn't change, but we have a different shape here. So we see that we have a straight drop going for a certain amount of time, and then it starts to oscillate. And by looking at the portion of straight voltage drop, we can again work out the ESR. So we can work out that in this case, the current was 766 milliamps, 
and based on this voltage drop and the current, we can work out that the ESR is around 50 milliohms. So if you try to simulate this circuit, in which we inserted the new ESR, we get quite a similar waveform. So we can see the straight bit of voltage drop and then the oscillation going on. Now the reason why this is oscillating this time is that even though we have a low ESR, so our straight voltage drop is now much smaller, the damping factor now turned into a subunity value. So if we work out the damping factor for this system, we have our 8.2 micro Henry inductor, 100 microfarad capacitor, and the total series resistance of 340 milliohms, our damping factor is 0.58. So this is an underdamped circuit, so it will oscillate. So what do you do this time? Well, we can try to increase the capacity, and that's the next thing I tried. So I put two of these 100 microfarad tantalum capacitors, but in this case, both in the measurement and in the simulation, we still have a bit of a hump here. So we see that our ESR voltage drop is even smaller this time, but we still see a small oscillation going on, and that is because our damping factor is still below 1. So it's 0.76 in this case. Now we could try adding more and more capacitors, but that's not a very efficient way to fix things. But on the other hand, we could try to increase the ESR. Now, I don't want to choose a tantalum capacitor that has a bigger ESR or look for the electrolytic capacitor with just the right value, but rather we can do something else, and that is artificially add the ESR. So what I did here is add an extra 100 milliohm resistor in series with the two capacitors. So is this thing right here. So I just interconnected the two capacitors, decoupled them from the supply line and added this extra resistor. And if we look into the simulation, we should be getting a very nice, very smooth transition. And that's exactly what happens in real life. By adding this extra 100 milliohm resistor, we increase the ESR so we can see that our straight voltage drop is much larger this time, but we also corrected the damping factor to be exactly 1. And the result is that we no longer have any undershoot and we no longer have any oscillations. And the reason why you would opt for this sort of ESR increase, so by adding extra resistors, is because this system will be stable not just at room temperature, but also at different temperatures. So one of the main problems with the electrolytic aluminum capacitors is that their ESR is highly temperature dependent. So if you go to negative temperatures and very low negative temperatures, your ESR will increase by a very large amount. So it can go up by a factor of 10 in extreme cases. So your system will no longer be stable at that point, or you will have completely different results. By taking this approach, so taking a low ESR, very stable capacitor like the tantalum one that is not very affected by temperature, and adding a dedicated resistor, your system will be stable throughout the temperature range. So all in all, to make sure that you have a good decoupling system for your circuit, you need to ensure that your ESR is low enough so that the voltage drop during transients is not very big, but also you need to make sure that the combination of the capacitance and the ESR and the inductance of the wire doesn't cause the system to oscillate. And you can do that by checking the damping factor. So all in all, hope you got some useful information after this. Leave your thoughts in the comments. Thank you for watching. Make sure to subscribe to be up to date with all my latest videos. And see you next time. Bye bye.